Hi, I'm Colette Bancroft, the book editor at the Tampa Bay Times, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the virtual Times Festival reading and to the annual Books and Bourbon. We'd like to thank Linda Restaurant in St. Petersburg and Chef Jeff Perdue for hosting us tonight. Um, and we will be taking questions from the audience later in the hour. So please enter your questions in chat for Ace and Lisa to respond to. New York Times bestselling author Ace Atkins has been nominated for every major award in crime fiction, including The Edger three times, twice for novels about former U.S. Army Ranger Quinn Colson. Atkins has written 11 books in the Colson series, the latest of which, The Heathens, was published this year. Atkins also continued Robert B. Parker's iconic Spencer character after Parker's death in 2010, adding eight best-selling novels in that series, The Ninth, Someone to Watch Over Me, will be published, I think, in 2022. Okay. The new one is uh, Bye Bye Baby. It'll be out. Oh, Bye Bye Baby. Oh, that's right. Bye Bye Baby. It's mine. I forgot about the last one. Yeah. All right. I'll print a correction. <laughs> He's a former newspaper reporter for the then St. Petersburg Times and the Tampa Tribune, and he was an officer in Mississippi with his family. Lisa Unger is a New York Times and internationally best selling author with books published in 30 languages and millions of copies sold worldwide. She's widely regarded as a master of suspense. Her latest psychological thriller, Last Girl Ghosted, was published in October. She's been nominated for or won numerous awards, including the Ham Prize, the Academy Thriller Award, and Goodreads Choice. In 2019, she received two Edgar Award nominations in one year. She lives on the west coast of Florida with her family. I'm delighted to have two stalwarts of the Festival of Reading back. And I, I wanted to ask, because I couldn't quite figure it out, how long have you been doing books and bourbons? Is it like the 1960s, if you remember? <laughs> <laughs> it is like that. I think it's been, I think we're going on, well, having skipped a year mm -hmm. in between, like, I maybe five, six, or seven. Maybe so, I think you're going back to that. I think you and I met as a result of the Times Festival. It's not exactly oh how, we, how, we, how we connected. Well, I remember when I, so when I was first published by St. Martin's this is back in the Stone Ages. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I and I was like looking through the St. Martin's catalog, one of the things that printed catalogs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so I was looking through and I saw your your book and I was like, oh, who is in Tampa? I'm just sending an email. So I did like meet the author, like sent you an email, and you wrote me back, and then we met for the first time, maybe at that time. I think so. so. I, I think the first one we met was actually, I want to say it was somewhere in St. Pete. Yeah. It's been quite yeah. some time. It was really, <laughs> oh, really, really good. Good. And now we're besties, like yeah. forever besties. For yeah. sure. Absolutely. We've been yeah. very good friends, been a lot of common, and that's the, the great thing about the, the book business is mm -hmm. we uh, met. Good friends, and, yeah. and we've been staying, staying close friends for now over. I don't want to say it. I'm not even saying it. I think it's so 20, well. 20, more than 20, more more 20 years. years. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's a business of relationship, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. Sure. That's, you know, that's the joy of it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For yeah. sure. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. And whose idea was books and movies? Mine. <laughs> <laughs> it's my idea. They're going to find us. I think we found some commonality in two things that we feel very passionate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. I have brought a, I brought a bottle of bourbon to our pop for our piano all the time. Do you remember? Yeah. I, I, do, I, I got it in my bag and I took it out in the middle of our, and I also happened to have glasses. Yeah. And I think people were actually surprised that we were actually going to drink and talk at the same time. Because yeah. everything is kind of, you know, some book talks are somewhat stilted where people are talking and, you know, they're very reserved. Yeah. And then we just point the bottle down and we just start talking. <laughs> and and we, we offended so many people. Yeah, yeah. there were all the people who said terrible things about it. It was them. horrible. And then afterwards, I was like, did you drink on your panel? I was like, what did I, I, think, I, think what did I get? Was, was the, uh, the yes, but you did, but, but it took me on the cut. Yeah, I'm not sure who says it really <laughs> exactly <laughs> sanctioned for that. Oh, but, wow. uh, but it continued to be one of our most popular events. <laughs> <and it was, laughs> yeah. You know, and that's why I wanted to, to fly down here. Be a part of it. I think that all of us are kind of tired of mm -hmm. doing the, yeah. the Zoom calls and split screens. And, and uh, you know, fortunately, uh, hopefully, the world has opened up a little bit mm -hmm. and I can safely come down here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I've been triple vaccinated. I'm ready to go. Mm -hmm. And so, one of the yeah. first things I wanted to do was rejoin the festival. Yeah, and I'm so glad you did. Oh, it's, it's, and Lisa, I've seen Lisa 
things before technology changed everything uh, or embrace it. And so, um, in some ways, you know, I kind of want to go back to the past. I can hold a writable story that, yeah. you know, is that I'm working on a, a book right now. It's uh, years before this, and it's kind of a comfort. <laughs> but at the same time, you have to find the ways. And this, this is new writing. I mean, even, even our copy editors kind of didn't sure how to format this correctly. Yeah. No, it's true. It's, I mean, it's uh, all these new questions about formatting and stuff. I mean, yeah. Listen, like, it's well, super apt and wasn't one of her books like for she just, she that she like kept, in the yeah. she, she, she decided, decided it, it was a little longer, <laughs> but she decided early on, yeah, to keep Kinsey on in the 80s, right? And, and now and so Kinsey never had a cell phone, never had the internet, never had, Do you know, yeah. actually, uh, Bob Parker, kind of did yeah, he did. and I mm -hmm. think there was actually maybe one book where uh, Spencer got a cell phone, <laughs> yeah, you know, but you know. The one thing about that when I was writing Spencer books is that the marching orders was to, to write something that was modern. Mm -hmm. And I thought, boy, 90% of Spencer's cases have been solved with the Google. Yeah, exactly. you know? and so, you know, <laughs> if you're truly the world's greatest <laughs> private eye, you should know how to use Google. Right? Yeah, I, I think that's something that maybe over like, you know, Pam yeah, and Jan. Sure. And all, all of those books, if, you know, Phil Marlowe had had Google, those books would have been three pages long. <laughs> <laughs> Not very satisfying, but yeah. just Google it. That's, yeah, that's, that's it. it. And then you have some great, you know, <laughs> you can, simile to describe the Google. Right. But that many have a great go. But um, Lisa, one thing, both in Ghost, Blessful Ghost, and then your previous book, Confessions, um, they both have to do with social media and dating apps, but also they both have to do with how those things are used by people to veil their identities and yes. create other identities. And yeah. crime fiction has always had people who are disguising their identities. That's you know, um, that's kind of a basic thing. But but this makes it in some ways so much easier to create a different person. Yeah, I mean, I think in a lot of ways we're all doing it. And we're all kind of experts at it. You know, we all have our social media profiles, and yeah. I always like joke about with, like my friends is like you know to talk about something they saw on. On social media, I was like, and we're always like, that's just Lisa over the avatar. That's not, yes. you know, that is the curated version. We all know that, mm -hmm. you know, real life is what happens in between those, you know, those, those cropped and curated and mm -hmm. filtered posts that you so carefully put out there in social media. And, you know, some of this, you know, it's a, some of it is a professional persona, but so many people now are, you know, I, I'm the mother of a young girl, and this is something that we that we think about and talk with her about all the time. It's like, how does this mean? How does this feed come to define you? You know, if mm -hmm. people come to look at that piece of you when they're looking, when you're looking for a job or when you're trying yeah. to get to college, like how does that define you? And then more, you know, more importantly, what are you telegraphing about yourself when you post on social media? You're, so you're telling people. Where you go to school, you're telling them where you got your coffee, you're telling them what kind of car you drive, you're telling them everything about yourself without even realizing that's what that's what you're doing. And most of the time, how many people, how many know. people, how many people know? And most of the time, you know, that's okay. You know, yeah. okay, most of the time it's all right. But there are people out there that are, you know, that are predators and they're watching for that. And they too have that ability to craft and create. And not everybody's doing it just because they want to put out the best version yeah, of themselves. Some, some, some of them are putting out a completely other persona and they're using it to groom and to lure yeah. young kids and girls into situations that they, you know, can't handle, whether it be mm -hmm. sending a picture of themselves online or, you know, if it's meeting, you know, meet me here, yeah. you know, that. So there's all these different ways now that social media, you know, um, you know, in, I guess in a lot of ways it's disconnecting us more than that is connecting yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah, I think you and I are very careful. Like, uh, I know yeah. so you know putting uh, your kids online mm -hmm. and your yeah. uh, child online. Yeah. And the same thing for me is like I just you know I occasionally get I, I, I'm very fortunate I'm here both are to get very nice letters from people and great stuff. But occasionally yes. we get some real news. Yeah. yeah, we get some real crazy folks mm -hmm. and, and I just don't want to expose it there. So right. we don't really post a lot about our personal life. We, right. we post yeah. a lot about you know our books and issues mm -hmm. that are going on or whatever. And the heathens, the social media that you write about, 
does apply to, to teenagers. When, when the Melissa Robinson case happened, it got huge media coverage. What about television and newspaper and radio coverage? But that's all it was. Then. Sure. Um, and you know, there was that car chase in Texas and all of this, and she got covered. But it gets escalated in the Cubans because they view TJ and her friends, the, the, the girl she kind of, you know, halfway befriends, shall we not, chastity. Chastity is one of those you know, kids who was born with a smartphone in her hand and right. knows how to manipulate social media. And at one point, TJ says, I should throw that thumb in the frame. Yeah. Um, and, and so you kind of write about the, the push pull of that too, with the same. I, I think it's a tremendous pressure that's put on. We, we both have yeah. uh, mm -hmm. teenage children, and, and uh, the, the pressure of having to represent yourself in a certain mm -hmm. way. Uh, and always feed that monster, and always feed what's going on, and always sort of, and also the way that people, um, I mean, for somebody like TJ, she is trying to reach a certain audience, trying to prove her innocence, yeah. she's trying to make a case, mm -hmm. so it's a very, you know, specific thing she's doing, but for all the other kids, they're trying to prove how important they are, yes. you know, how many followers they have, yeah. I mean, it's really, uh, it's so devastating for kids uh, today to try to try to prove how Worthy they are, yes. the, depending on how many followers they have, which is just absolutely yeah. insane. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I was just listening to you, um, the Ted, the Ted, a Ted, Ted Radio Hour, which is a, a podcast, and it is a this podcast about beauty. And um, the one of the um, one of the people interviewed was talking about social media and how girls like you know you get to your Instagram very curated, algorithmically dictated yes. feed. You're going to, they're going to continue to feed you the things that you know that that you, that they know that you like yeah, or that you're looking true. at. And so she was saying how like if you're a young girl and you're taking pictures of yourself on Instagram and you're posting them on Instagram and showing yourself and showing your body and showing your clothes, then that's the feed that you are going to get to your Instagram account. And so you're going to be inundated with images of these girls who are you know again curated, cropped, and filtered. You know, there's all this new software where you can you know completely change your image mm -hmm. and you know create a very different look for yourself than, than reality. And well, you so should, you should see my filters. I look just like <laughs> <the worst. laughs> oh, that's so that's so they get these and then they have to compare their very messy three-dimensional lines mm -hmm. to these two-dimensional lines that they're seeing on screen, mm -hmm. and it's yeah. devastating. And the kids that age have always done that. And you know, I can remember when I was 13, the TV, I, you know, you, care, you compare yourself to your friends, you compare yourself to a magazine. magazine. And, yes. and it's, and it's, it's a horrible age. You know, it's it's right horrible. horrible. It is a terrible. It's the yeah. worst age. So yeah, it like is. Like 14, 15 years yeah. the worst yeah. Yeah. because yeah. you just, you know, you're, you're, you're neurotic all the time about how you look, how you dress. And this just takes that not only are you having that self, you know, uh, reflection, you're also putting out saying, "Am I okay? Yes. Am I, am I good enough?" People are not. And look at this other person who's obviously okay, mm -hmm. who's obviously perfect, and I am not. Mm -hmm. Never imagine it's that same little girls on the other side. Of that picture, prize yeah, that she way. herself does not feel perfect mm -hmm. compared to your photo, right. and so it's just very, you know, I mean, it's definitely something that needs to be looked at and addressed, mm -hmm. and, you know, for sure. But it, it is something that for for modern storytellers we have to mm -hmm. address because it's just so prevalent, and, and, and you know, we're kind of criticizing this stuff, but at some point. We will take these pictures that we're here today yes. and we're going to be putting them on our social media. Well, it's a
Well, and yet technology has evolved a hundredfold, mm -hmm. thousandfold. Yeah. And you know, our brains are grappling mm -hmm. with I mean it's they're being rewired by technology. There's no, yeah. no way to there's yeah. no way to be less than yeah. yeah. I mean well there was something today I saw that was a fine arms piece of today, just to elevate the conversation. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> 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 There was, there was a, a Japanese sculpture that was showing uh, newspapers that were in this box. You know, you see this, it's like ceramics. And it was a commentary on how um, the digestion of, of uh, news and of information had gotten to be such a, a trend and so overwhelming that it was the, the Japanese artist was being critical of it, that it was just really kind of a bad thing for society. Mm -hmm. And I do feel like people these days, I mean, I'm, I'm working on a, a, a project that's back in the 1960s, and I think about that time, or the 1970s, when I was growing up, where we were watching three networks, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we were reading the local news, right. and we were getting our newspaper, and that mm -hmm. was it. And that was probably a very healthy level mm -hmm. of consumption. Yes. Where our brain should evolve to that. Right, but yeah, yeah, we right. evolved, right. it was yeah. good, you're we fine. Yeah. But now, it is just so overwhelming, and I don't think there are, there are many people who can handle it. Mm -hmm. I think there are people who are just- Yeah, uh, it's like a fire. Information all the time coming in from every different direction, mm -hmm. every you know, every different device, and yeah, and, and, and to really bring this conversation down is it's I think it's going to be everyone doing <laughs> 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 eventually all this stuff. Uh, it's, 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 it's so much genre and age is one of the genres that age become such a huge factor is crime fiction. Yeah. You know, in literary fiction, it's, you know, people can take it or leave it. And, and uh, you know, it has some, they play some role in things like romance and, mm -hmm. and things like that. But but it's really in crime fiction. As you say, you can't ignore it. Well, I, I think in crime fiction, I think the great thing about crime fiction, and, and at least I've had this conversation, conversation many times talking about how, how crime fiction, the importance of it, it's always been about social uh, being, uh, relevant and, mm -hmm. and talking about what's going on right now mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know both politically yeah, and criminality criminality and yes. how things are going to be able to yes. find some kind of order and then some type of social consciousness and, and what's going on. I mean, I think that's what we're probably most proud about. I'm proud of working in this this genre mm -hmm. is we're able to look at what's going on uh, you know in our world and that's, that's yes. hopefully what we try to do. And I think that's what you know even going back to Hammett, going back to Chandler. Mm -hmm. Is just you know oh, it's yeah. very much very familiar to me. That's why I got into this particular type mm -hmm. of storytelling. This is very much like journalism. This is just yeah. holding up a mirror to the world exactly. and saying what is going on, and what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hannah and Chandler were both all about class, you know, right? Oh, about, you know, the, the class groups. status and the relationship yes. between you know the social social classes and all that kind of thing. Well, just to totally switch um, from social media, both of these novels, like a lot of crime fiction and or almost end, I think mean, they both sort of have codes, but they sort of build up to big, violent confrontations. <laughs> yeah. Well, sure. well yeah. you know, we like our social commentary, <laughs> but we like our good shootout right. well. right. and, 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 and I wonder as you <laughs> as you're writing these books, you know, you know you're you know you're probably gonna get to that. It's probably not gonna end with a chess now. Right. <laughs> and and uh, I once reviewed the last Harry Potter book and I said it ended with a battle and a woman called me up really, really furious saying, you spoiled it. And I, and and I, I thought, what did you do? <laughs> 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 you know, that's awesome. Yeah. But these books will end in, in very pretty intense, uh, not end. The, the come come to uh, pretty intense confrontations. When you're writing and you know you're going to be writing that part of the book, do you have to gear yourself up for it? Do you have to prepare yourself? I've got to, tomorrow I've got to put blood on the walls. <laughs> <laughs> and how, and the, how does it affect you when you're writing and then after you're writing? I mean, for me, everything has to be like sort of a natural evolution of the story mm -hmm. and the character. You know, there's not, it's not like, I, I never sit down to write that final that final scene. Like that's not why I sit down to write the book. You know, when I start with the kind of character voice in my head, you know, I don't really know that much about those people. You know, we talked about this so many times, yeah. and they kind of evolve for me on the page. 
And as they evolve, the story evolves. It evolves to me much the way it will evolve for my reader later. And you know, I know that we're going to come to some kind of a big event or some big event, but I don't ever really know 100% what that's mm -hmm. going to be. And so it always feels very organic and new to me when I get to that space. And I know that you know, I've, made, I've, I've brought all these people to a certain space and there's going to be some kind of a conflict. It may be, it may be violent, maybe psychologically violent, it may be, you know, whatever it's going to be, there's going to be some big event towards the end of the book, but that's not ever why I, I it's not ever why I wrote the book right. or ever, you know, um, like, it's, it's not necessarily a foregone conclusion that's where we're going. So for me, it's always about like sort of the psychology of my character. And if, it, if that psychology organically comes to violence, then I I have to go there and kind of embrace that. But that's not why. I, I, I think that's really a testament to, to your writing is, is um, I'm reading your lines right now. And your characters are so fully written. I think this is the difference between what it's called like plot driven thrillers, mm -hmm. right? The character doesn't matter. Right. The character is Joe Blow, and mm -hmm. he's a chess, chess piece that's mm -hmm. been moved across. But I think with you, Lisa, I mean, your characters, it all, everything that happens is an evolution of who those people are. And I think that's what brings up the psychology of your, mm -hmm. uh, of your characters. Is you really, you're not just like, this person has a resume, and this person is doing this. It's really how how they would think and what they're going to have, and what they're going to do, and eventually how things are going to come out. So. Thank you. I feel the same way about your books, too. I feel like the layers are so, you know, we've talked about this before, like, you know, the tough guy with the, you know, with, with the gun and the yeah. thing that happens, the chase, all that. We've talked about that, and if you're looking for that, then that, that's there and that's great. But there's so many more layers to all the characters in your, in your books, especially in the Heathens, you know, just really, you know, getting to know um, TJ and, and her story and, you know, Quinn's kind of involvement with her and how he, you know, connects with her because of his own past. Yeah. and. You know, all those different layers, it's like when, it, you know, when you follow those characters to their story, if it comes to that kind of big, you know, event at the end, like that is, feels real, it feels like Here, Cheers to that. We're going to drink to that. There we go. Cheers. cheers. I, I think that there was something that I learned a lot uh, from Elmo Leonard, which is he really uh, got so involved creating these wonderful characters, yeah. and then how they bounced off each mm -hmm. other was how it's Right. The story was yes, going exactly. to shake yeah. up. And I think that both of us are from that school of thought. We didn't yes. come up with this whole idea of how the chess pieces are going to work, right. eventually how the, the shootout is going to happen. That kind of yeah. But really, who are these people yeah. and why would they make certain choices? Yeah, let's right. these people to work together. Exactly. Yeah. And that's a fun thing. Yeah, I have this uh, um, a gentleman that I speak to out in California. He's a clinical psychiatrist. I mean, I don't speak to him myself, you know, for my, for my characters, of course. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he showed up at one of my events and, in California. And he, um, you know, he said, You know, I feel like when I read one of your books, I know we're always going to wind up in the woods. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, shit. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, shit. You're right. <laughs> we are. We're going to and I had never, and that had never, that had never occurred to me as something that I do, but like I feel like there's this sort of draw back to, you know, to nature. There, there is so like, much with your books where it is, is this thing that's with the city, and you're so fixated right. on New York because in your time in New York, but then yeah. there's also this drawback to the mm -hmm. more simpler times and exactly. right. something's more real okay. environment. So, yeah, it's a pullback, and I, I actually. I, I mean, you're going to be. What does that mean? How does that make you feel? Like <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? That makes me feel great. I'm sorry, I like colors. I feel like I, mean, I see it too, like in some of my some of the short stories I've written in the last couple of years. You know, like there's this almost like a nostalgia, you know, like a pullback to, you know, that kind of, that, you know, I always think of it as an analog time, it's really not the right or correct word, use of the word, but like an analog watch, like a timepiece, mm -hmm. it's only designed to do one thing, which is to keep time. You know, and I do feel this kind of nostalgia sometimes for those silent things that wait for you to, to do the thing they were designed to do, like the radio right. or the television. You know, the radio is not like going, hey, hey, yeah. oh, you know, like, right, right. you know, it's like, hey, hey, and then, like it's there, it's quiet because you can hear it on. You know, like the VCR, like the you know the tactile feeling of putting 
team this yeah. year, this year mm -hmm. player. But I do, I mean, maybe this is natural to my age or this happens to everybody, but you do start to feel a craving for those simpler, mm -hmm. you know, maybe not socially better, but in some ways quieter. Mm -hmm. Uh, there, there's a point I think, I think we were not trying to, you know, sell books and market books and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really miss the idea of having just a, a just a big yellow phone in my kitchen. Yeah, right. 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 Yeah, we're trying to reach readers, we're trying to interact with readers, but at some point, you know, as far as I'm interacting with like friends from high school or whatever, yeah. like, to hell with those losers. <laughs> 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 but, but, I, you know, but there was a great, a great passage I think I sent you about the early story, you broke Rachel about old houses, mm -hmm. and they held like, yeah. these secrets and these feelings. Yeah. And, like, so where does that come from for you? Where does it come from, like, the, the old mm -hmm. the nostalgia, that, that, that time of like, uh, you know, Getting back to the woods, getting back getting, to the getting back to the woods. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like I also and this is another thing that somebody had also brought up about mm -hmm. the half the old houses in, in my books and stuff. And I, you know, I, I really had to think about it and I think about like the houses in my in my life, the houses that I think about, like my grandmother's house, mm -hmm. the house that I grew up in, like my aunt's apartment in New York City. Um, our house where, you know, we, we lived for, for 20 years where I brought my big daughter home from the hospital. I think about these spaces and to me, they're like people, yeah. you know, they have this energy and this vibration and I was a certain person in those places and it meant a certain, those walls meant a certain thing to me. They, they framed experiences in my life that were, that were formative, you know, they held emotion and, you know, and or witness mm -hmm. to who I was at that time. And they feel like people to me when I think about them and I feel their energy. And so I feel like that comes up again, again in the books, like, you know, there's a, a broken down house that needs to be fixed, you know, like there's this desire to create, you know, that living space, mm -hmm. you know, a, a number of my characters have that. There's a desire to like set things on fire, mm -hmm. to burn it to the ground. Yeah. You know, like, no, this is wrong. It needs to, it needs to die. Yeah. It needs to get burned down yeah. and something needs to go yeah. up in its place. Yeah. And so like that for me comes up again and again. Well, Ace, that's, that's true in your book. So the Folsom book, certainly. But, you know, Quinn lives on his, his uncle's arm. Mm -hmm. sure. How old was that ass? It's 100 something years old. And that's, uh, you know, I, I did something really crazy uh, 20 years ago, which is, uh, so I, I met my wife here in, in, uh, in Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, she was working for the, the Safety Times at the time. Mm -hmm. yeah, she, yeah, I don't know if it's true, but you told me a very romantic story that you met you at a crime scene over up on the body. That is actually, actually true. Oh but, my God, I mean, it. But it's true. We, uh, we were uh, covering a, uh, somebody had died. Uh, uh, it's a terrible story, actually. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, from the most forever. Like, what? Well, Who's this very uh, beautiful woman? They said, and I was like, I thought she was my rival. I was working for the Tribune. She was working uh, for the St. Peter York Times, yeah, which I have to admit was a uh, much better newspaper. I hate to say that. And so, what else? And so, uh, we ended up, uh, you know, many years later, we met her a few years later getting married. And uh, so that's. Oh, I'm going to write that. I'm writing that to write the question. It was. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the house. I'm sorry. So the house. Uh, so anyway, so after I uh, met this wonderful woman who was a reporter for the uh, St. Pete Times, uh, I convinced her. I said, hey, that's a great idea. You know, like Tampa is, and St. Pete is beautiful. This is a wonderful place to be. There's palm trees and gorgeous stuff and everything. You've got a great job here. Let's move to rural Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so I was from here for, for specific reasons. I was there because of, you know, I wanted to move to Oxford, Mississippi because of Lillian Faulkner. And also I was very uh, taken with uh, uh, the writer Larry Brown, who's so alive, and Barry Hanna, and yeah. Willie Morris. And it was kind of an epicenter of some writing. And I said, let's, let's move to Oxford, Mississippi. And so she made the terrible mistake of saying, <laughs> sure, yeah, I'll go with you. And so we bought this old farmhouse that was out in the county, uh, about 20 miles south of Oxford, Mississippi. It was built in 1895. And so that particular passage that I read of yours today 
about the feeling of those houses and the story and feeling that you felt a presence there, um, it, it really rang true. I think it's absolutely true. And so we still have that farm. We, we don't live there anymore, uh, you know, mainly because it's haunted, but we'll talk about that. <laughs> oh God, so that's, a whole other show. that's a whole different podcast that we'll talk about. Uh -huh. uh, but we live, uh, we live closer to town. We still have this farm. And I do feel like a lot of my stories with Gwen mm -hmm. and writing about that world, I feel like has actually come out of this world and feeling this this yeah. kind of, uh, you know, this history of yeah. this, this old house, you know? Yeah, and the land that it's on, you know, the energy of the land, too. Is oh, for sure. Up to me again and again. Like, you know, it, the, the earth holds vibration, you yeah. know, and some, you know, some of it's dark and, and some of it's joyful. And I, I do believe that you can feel it. Yeah, you know, I, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. you, I think you told me that you created Tidhawk County because you wanted your own job. It was it. It was yeah, it. I mean, like, you know, story. That, that was it. I mean, I mean living in, in Oxford, Mississippi, you cannot uh, help but feel the residence of Faulkner. And, and uh, I was very fortunate when we first moved there. Uh, Faulkner's niece was essentially raised by Faulkner because her father had died um, before she was even born. Um, became a dear friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And so all that mm -hmm. Faulknerian kind of thing yeah. definitely put into mm -hmm. the type of storytelling mm -hmm. I wanted to do. All right. Let me ask. Both of you, one more question, and then I think we probably need to move over for uh, audience questions. Yeah. But um, it's you know, the standard question. I know you don't talk about your next book, mm -hmm. but can you can you at least for for your, your fans tell us when it'll be out and whether there's a title? Oh, don't even get me started on the titles. <laughs> There, there is not, there is not yet a title, but I will say that I have written the end on my twentieth novel. Wow, which is kind of That's kind of felt like a really big deal. Yeah, it was. It kind of felt like a really big deal. It will be out in October mm -hmm. of twenty twenty two, and um, it will be uh, a psychologically suspenseful. <laughs> <laughs> it, it will be dark. And bad, bad things will will happen, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll walk through those things in some light. After we go through the woods, <laughs> after, we get, after we get through the woods, we, everything will be, you know, not okay, but better. Ace, <laughs> <laughs> can you tell us that since I blew my key on the park? Oh, can you tell us a little bit about that Parker book? Yeah, and sure. Also, sure. what. It, you mentioned the project you're working on, Seven Sisters, and so forth. Hey, tell us a little bit. Well, I'm always so envious that uh, every time I see Lisa, that she's like, Yeah, I've got it done. And it's coming out at the end of 2022. And I'm like, Oh my God. So, but I do have a book coming out in uh, January, which will be uh, my 10th Spencer novel. Wow. And it actually will be the 50th. Spencer novel overall. Yeah. Um, Parker created this character 50 years ago in the work catching up on a 50th book. And uh, it, it's really with, with this one premise. Um, a couple of years ago, I think it was actually the last time that I was flying, which is besides here. Uh, the fir the, this is the first time I've been flying since yeah. uh, 2019. But I was in uh, a book tour for 2019, I think, for a Spencer novel. And uh, there was a guy that was sitting in front of me, an older guy, and he was talking about this and that and politics. And I was trying to ignore him. <laughs> but he said, uh, he was talking about. Uh, Congresswoman, Congresswoman AOC, and he said, uh, just in front of everybody, he said, I, I wish that woman um, would get a bullet in the head. And he said this in front of a woman in color, of color who was sitting in front of me, who was with a yeah. child. And he said it so blatantly, like, everyone should just accept this. And I just thought, like, these are people that are just saying this in public. What if, you know, how does somebody like that, Congresswoman, deal with these threats yeah. all the time? Yeah. How do they deal? How do they do their job? How do they go about with not just a person on the plane, but hundreds and thousands yeah. of people saying these things? And I read something about the AOC uh, when I was writing this book that said that she received hundreds and thousands of death threats every yeah. day. And I thought, how does she do this? So anyway, that was the, the catalyst, uh, was about Spencer working with a woman who was a congresswoman in, uh, in Boston mm -hmm. and trying to do her daily life. And it's really not a political book, it's not about, but it's just about somebody who's trying to voice their opinion and the fact that in today's America, that voicing your opinion 
if it's not popular, is receiving this type of hate, uh, which is not the America I think that you and I grew up in. I think mean, it's the America that we all grew up in. Uh, so anyway, that's the, the book. It's called Bye Bye Baby Abraham Jacob. And the 60s. I cannot talk about that. Oh, but I would be glad it is, I call it my uh, top secret Memphis project. Because yeah. so, I was wondering if it was canon. Because you know I have a title of White Shadow. I keep waiting for you to know. I, I do have a book that I've been wanting to write for some time that is a sequel to White Shadow. And I actually thought that that was going to be the next book that I was going to yeah. be writing after White Shadow. I thought it was going to be a trilogy. And um, the publisher said, you know, for whatever reason, I wanted to write something else. Uh, but I do think at some point, I think like uh, one of your colleagues, Paul Guzzo, who writes this wonderful stuff, he keeps on writing about this stuff about the 1950s Tampa, yeah. and Polita, and about right. you know, what happened in the underworld. I'm saying, God, Paul, why do you keep on writing this stuff? Because it's drawing me back to, yeah. to wanting to write about my shadow. I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, anyway, I miss that world. And every time yeah. I'm down here, I just I turn a corner. And uh, this is just the most noir place on the planet. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I love it. And yeah. So hopefully, I'll be back. Okay. Ellen, do we have some uh, questions for the audience? We do. And as Paul Guzzo's editor, I appreciate that shout out. (laughs) (laughs) Um, All right. I'm going to start with a real easy one because somebody wanted to know this early on. What kind of bourbon are you drinking? (laughs) Oh, you're not happy about the burgers. So today we are drinking Willits, which is, what do you think? How do you like it? Have you had it before? I, I have had Willet, but I have not had it, the I Dream of Jeannie bottle. Okay. Uh, oh, it's a wonderful right. husband chef that brought along with us tonight. Oh, uh, but right. I think that if I rub it, I think it gets better and better. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it's been, um, they've been distilling this bourbon since 1936. And the reason it is in this Jeannie bottle is that this is a, uh, a, a replica of the original copper still from the first Willet refinery. Is that the right word there? Yes. Jeff, yeah. Jeff always picks the bourbon. He's the bourbon drinker, so he always picks the bourbon. I think it's terrific. I yeah. think that really, if Willet wanted to, to yeah. back a truck up to our house, That's right. to, to bring okay. us a bottle of, uh, bottles of right. Willet, we'd right. be very, very well, right. so, so we'll so we'll 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 from now on. There we go. You know, there is a story. I'll, I'll, we'll go on to the next question very quickly, but uh, I cannot remember who told me this, but somebody would cover back in the day uh, the, the late great John McDonald mm-hmm. and a question came about from a journalist um, who was it Jay Steele who was it the, the uh, he was one of the editors that, of the Tribune I can't remember his name but anyway he had interviewed years ago Johnny McDonald mm-hmm. and he said why did why did Travis do he change from Clinic Gin to Boodle's Gin what was that all about and he had covered the story which is apparently the Boodle's representative said I think he said uh, there was a case that came to Johnny McDonald's house in Sarasota. Uh, 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 <laughs> and there was something that said, I think that uh, Travis McGee needs to change his brand. <laughs> and that's how the change happened. Okay. So we yeah. will be glad yeah. that Willett to do this. Exactly. Yeah. I think that Willett should sponsor a Wilson group, a bourbon tour for us <laughs> that we could go on together. I think it's the finest bourbon. <laughs> every oh, sorry, every state makes it better. All right. <laughs> I shouldn't have started there. <laughs> our next question I'm going to take from our friend Craig Pittman, one of tomorrow's authors on the festival, uh, who is happy celebrating. Birthday, I was just going to say it's his birthday and he's with us. Uh, happy um, birthday. <laughs> we won't sing. Um, question for both authors. You are both prolific writers. Do you feel driven to finish writing a new book as quickly as possible? Or do you wish you had more time to polish your manuscript, manuscript before you hit deadline? Sure. sure. <laughs> um, I, you know, a book a year for me is, is pretty comfortable. In a lot of ways, it's harder for me not to write than it is to write. Um, I I feel like if I go a couple days without writing, I start to feel sort of unmoored. You know, I feel like in a lot of ways, the page is where I metabolize um, darkness or, you know, things that I'm thinking about. It's where I answer all of my questions that I have about people. 
usually, you know, what's wrong with people. Um, so I have these, you know, I have, I do have this very um, sort of native desire to, to write that I, that I don't recall ever not having. So for me, it's, it's, it's fairly comfortable. And I feel like, you know, I'm just kind of, you know, I'm just kind of writing all the time. Like it's a continuum of reading, research and writing continuum. Like the reading influences the writing, the research influences the writing, the writing influences the research. And that's just kind of the, you know, that's just kind of the path that I have been on since as long as I can remember. I don't feel like I don't have enough time to write the book that I want to write. I feel like every book is, you know, sort of the pinnacle of my ability at the, at the time of its writing. And I think that every good writer, I think, has a little neurotic behavior. Is that okay to say? Uh, that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> a few years ago, I was, I was fortunate to uh, meet Richard Russo, mm -hmm. who is a wonderful writer. And he talked about uh, the fact that he felt it was almost like therapy. Yeah. And the fact that his writing helped stabilize him. Yeah. And yeah. I think that really the, the best writers have compulsion to write. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily something that you read with money, it's not necessarily you think about. It's something that really drives us yeah. to just put it on the page. Absolutely. And if not, I think we Yeah, I mean, I just feel like it's, you know, I don't remember a time before I, you know, was a writer. I don't yeah. remember, I don't remember a time before that. So I think it was probably for me when I was my early teens. Yeah. And then once I found it, it was just like a compulsion. Yeah. Like I couldn't stop doing it. I mean, and Lisa and I talk about it again, we've talked about this many times. So there was <laughs> there are a lot better ways of making money in this world. <laughs> than we did yeah. not to get into this business to be financially rewarded. You um, get into it just for love. Yeah, that's true. I mean, right? Because we, you probably think of your life as a reader before a writer. Like, I always think yeah. of my life as a reader. Like, that's where we fall in love with the story. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember ever not being in love with stories, my own and the stories of other people. And, you know, we may not do it for money, but we do it for the love. And, you know, that, that's, you know, that's the real joy. That's the real reward of writing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the free bourbon. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can read all. <laughs> there is another question that plays into that. You address some of the, some of this, the tell us how you write and what makes you sit down. But do you think of it as work? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there are days where it's lovely. And yeah. I've got a, a wonderful small office on the, the Oxford, Oxford, Mississippi Square, where I can look out and it's very fun area and I can see the old courthouse and I can see where um, the sound of the fury was set and it's very mm -hmm. inspiring. I'm putting off pages and it's lovely. Uh, but there's some days I want to take my, my laptop and I want to throw it out <laughs> into the street. And how about you? Is it equally frustrating? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, you know, like I, I really, Colin and I have talked about this before. That like, it's this, it's this union of magic and craft. You know, so some days you have these magical days, right? Like where the writing, you, know, you can't stop pages from flowing. Yeah. You know, you feel very in touch with your manuscript, and you feel like you know what you're doing. And then you have these days where, you know, like I, I. I've talked about this with Jennifer McMahon, who's a very, a very talented writer, where you feel like you've got you you got kicked out of the manuscript. Mm -hmm. Like so I have these days where I feel like, you know, I look at it and I'm like, oh my God, what am I writing? This is not right, you know, or worse than that. I, I can't figure it out, I can't make it right. And like the manuscript is kind of like, yeah, but that's a new <laughs> get out. <laughs> right? So sure. you just kind of get out, you know, like out of it and then you're miserable because you don't know what comes next and then you know whatever you bake a cake or you go to the gym or whatever it is you do to kind of like get everything you need again and then it, you know then you're back in it lets you back in and that's, I, I, you know, that's exciting i think it's a strange thing yeah. because i think we've probably all had people who told us like just sit down and write like go and mow the grass yeah go and, and, and do this kind of thing <laughs> and it is such a weird thing because yeah. there are parts of like when I was a reporter, you just had to do it. Yeah, right. There was no question. You had, you could tell your, you know, you could tell your editor, like, I'm not feeling the muse today. Yeah, I'll cover this bird. But there, there are days where forcing creativity is very hard. Right, so, and, and you can rely on your craft, and you can, you can be, you know, some writers say, well, I just want to put anything down. I have this word count and whatever. Yeah. I don't, I don't subscribe to that. 
but I, you know, you do have to show up every day. You do have to be there for creativity. And it does seem that the more you show up for it, the more it shows up for you. Yeah. But you definitely do have those moments where, I mean, it's like an organic process, right? So there's an ebb and a flow. Yeah. And you have to be as comfortable in the ebb days as you are in the flow days. Yeah. You know, like that's just as my, my, my father, who was an old uh, football coach, used to say the first world, uh, rule of, you know, working out is showing up. Yeah, and, and even if you're not having a great day, you got to show up. Exactly. And there was, there was a writer who came into town in Oxford who was talking, he was really bragging about this. He said, You know, I have spent five years trying to craft the most perfect beginning sentence. And it's taking five years. I was like, Well, you were lazy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? I mean, like, there's nobody in the newspaper business. Maybe you should consider it. That's the real <laughs> okay so when you write fiction that is based on true events how do you decide what details and how many details to change and have you ever gotten feedback from someone involved in the real event inspired by the uh, that inspired the book no i mean some of my stuff has been based on you know real things from from my life and things that i've experienced but maybe they not yeah. Not. I'm terrible. I actually always take <laughs> stuff on real <laughs> I, 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 Maybe that's my, my lack of creativity or, or whatever. But I'm always going to real events to draw like, energy and story upon. Uh, yeah. But I'll answer your question, which is uh, feedback. Uh, probably one of the most true, event, true events that I ever wrote about was about the murder of a guy named Charlie Wall, who was uh, a kingpin in Tampa. He was a famous bootlegger during. Uh, Prohibition, and he was murdered in the 1950s. And so I wrote a book about the murder of Charlie Wall and the investigation that followed it. I don't really get into this because I, I really try to blend the world to being uh, a novelist and a journalist and trying to get the facts. And, you know, and if it's a certain day, I like to get the weather straight and all that kind of stuff. But uh, anyway, uh, in the book, um, not to spoil anything more for anybody, but I name a guy who I really truly believe was the killer of Charlie Wall. And uh, this came from, I was so fortunate when I was writing this book because there were people who were still alive, who were mm -hmm. policemen, who were detectives, I mean, were detectives and, and, and journalists who had covered the case. So I could call them up and say, who really did it? What really happened? And so they all believed that there was a guy named Joe Badani who was kind of like a local hitman who was working with the Trap Conti brothers, that kind of thing. So it was a pretty logical explanation. And so I was doing a book signing in Ybor City. Uh, my buddy Jay Nolan was there. And a guy came up and I said, Oh my God, holy shit, this guy looked just like Joe Badani. And he kept on inching forward and I'm signing books, I'm signing books, and this guy comes up and goes, Hey, I'm going to tell you something. It's like Joe Badani's son. And I thought, Holy crap, what's going to happen right here? And, then, and, and he said, uh, He said, I read your book and I'm like, I'm bracing myself for it because I want to tell you, you got pops just right. <laughs> and so, you know, I felt relieved by that. So there are points where, you know, you write about that world where, but then again, you know, I also, uh, you know, written about people in a way that uh, you don't even figure that are, that are true life characters that will come back and say, I'm somebody's grandson and you malign my grandfather or whatever. And so I say tough. <laughs> Sorry, talk to Joe. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's what Tampa said. It's ever said. Talk to Joe McDonald. <laughs> okay, I think I've narrowed it down to two more. Uh, one is directly, directly for Ace, and it's, I wanted to know what it was like to be chosen to write for the Robert B. Parker estate. What was the process like and how difficult is it? Um, so, uh, so Robert B. Parker was uh, certainly a hero of mine. Um, Robert B. Parker, um, Elmore Leonard, these guys were like just so much uh, in the, the, the kind of books that I wanted to write. They were so, um, you know, er everything I do is so much influenced by, by these guys. So after Parker passed away in, in 2019, it was kind of widely known that they were putting out feelers of who was going to be writing a new Spencer book. The family did want the stuff to continue. 2010. 2010. 2010. Yeah, 2010. What is it? 2019. 2019. Boy, boy, 
sorry, the pandemic. The bourbon, the bourbon, the bourbon, the bourbon, the bourbon <laughs> And so, um, you know, in this, uh, so I was asked to um, put up, uh, you know, 50 pages and to write about uh, a new Spencer novel. And this was asked by my agent and also my publisher at the time. And so I wrote 50 pages of what I thought would be the next Spencer novel. And I, you know, I, I sent it away and I never thought about, uh, you know, whether it was going to happen or not happen. I was writing a Quinn Folsom book. And then it came back to me uh, at the late point of uh, 2010. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 uh, Bob Parker's wife and his longtime agent of like 40 years and his editor had all chosen me to write the next book. And so that's how it came about. As far as the people who were involved with it, as far as who was actually submitting other pages, I really never found out. Yeah. But you know what? They weren't good enough. They just didn't bring it. You know, let's just say, uh, Uh, this last one, I feel like you have both mentioned a haunted house, and the question was, can you tell us more about your haunted house? Ooh. <laughs> well, Maybe pick one story. I have, I have a lot. I have a lot of haunted houses. I have a lot of. I have a lot of places that I visit that are like sort of haunted, but they're haunted. That is really very much a thematic thing in your books. You always have yeah. haunted houses, and I always have. So there's usually somebody who's dead. Who's yeah. dead. Um, you know, there's usually the house could be haunted by memories or by um, actual ghosts or imagined ghosts. Um, you know, uh, it's just something that continues <laughs> that continuously. I'm making, I'm making eye contact with your husband right here. <laughs> <laughs> so like, yes. And I just, I, mean, I, I recently wrote a, a series of short, short stories called The uh, House of Crows. <laughs> And in the, it's a it's a serial anthology of four shorts um, that are you know it's a it's an overarching story but it's a, from the perspective of the four different characters and they all sort of return to this house that may or may not be haunted and it's you know um, it's something that I just kind of continuously go back to yeah. um, like I just feel like there's you know there's this energy in houses and in land and we don't and, and what is what is haunting. You know, is it is it an actual ghost? Is it a ghost of your memory? Is it a psychological event? Is it, is it a psycho spiritual event? And so I always have these big questions about you know sort of the human psyche, mm -hmm. and that is just believe it or not, it's just an extension of that. It's these questions I have about the human brain and about the, the psyche and about the spirituality. So I'm going to read a part for you uh, from your book, uh, mm -hmm. which I loved, which I, I put it um, uh, I put on social media today. So I'm going to read it. Um, you need my glasses? Uh, no, uh, thank you. I, I'm good. Yeah, <laughs> you, uh, but I thought this is great. I thought this was exactly what we're talking about here, which is, is that um, where houses are like people, they have memories of energy, they wait, uh, they will from neglect, um, they sicken and decay, they haunt, and they are haunted. The house was too big. Uh, rambling old place populated by, I'm sorry, it's not my, my eyes, I promise you. Uh, yeah. Reckless ghosts and bad memories that seem to be out of the trees as we uh, drew closer. Yeah. And I thought that was so true. So, having an old farmhouse, I felt that. Like, yeah. I felt that, like, I read that passage. I was like, wow, that's exactly what I feel when I'm out there. I feel yeah. like there's some energy out there. And yeah. I don't need to be like, we're not going to go on ghost hunters anytime soon. <laughs> <or anything like laughs> that. We can go check it out. Let's get a side. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, they do have this thing I'm alive that's hurt. Well, I think we'll talk after this. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, they could be like basic clothes. It does. Yeah. Yeah. You could do haunted houses in Berlin. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. Okay. We're on it. Well, Ellen, was that uh, was that our last? That was our last question. All right. All right. Well, we're going to wrap it up then. Um, I hate to. I, I love to sit here and talk to both of you for another 
until the burger runs out. <laughs> um, that might be so. That might be okay. <laughs> but I want to say thanks so much to AC Lisa for, for, for it was their idea to do this for the three of us to be in a room together instead yes. of on three Zoom screens, yes. which all of us are kind of. And we wish all of you who are watching were in the room, and we hope next time we do this, you will be. But, um, but it was great for both of you to, to do this, and yeah. Ace, especially for you to come to our panel. Oh, my pleasure. I've, been, I've actually been coming to this festival uh, since uh, 95. Yeah. And uh, Margot Hammond. Yeah. And uh, I remember being able to look before it's even published and meet uh, Kiki Friedman and James W. Knoll and went to the guest. And it's, so it's very personal yeah. because I think something that was, uh, I think, not festival. I would not have met these writers that influenced me very much. So I love it. That's right. Well, thanks so much to both of you. And thanks to Linger for hosting us and to Tom Below Books for its technical expertise. Um, Tom Below and Tampa's Oxford Exchange have copies of all of our festival books available so we can sign. Thanks so much to the audience for watching. And remember that the festival will continue each day through Sunday. Tomorrow we will have. Uh, birthday boy Craig Pittman and, Sid, and Cynthia Barnett, uh, both Florida nonfiction writers, talking about their books. On Saturday, we'll have crime fiction writer Michael Parita. Mm -hmm. And on Sunday, we'll have this year's Pulitzer Prize winner for fiction, Louise Erdrich. Mm -hmm. You can sign up for all of those events at festivalofreading.com. And thank you and good night. And, and if you haven't already, have some work. <laughs> <laughs>